a man, a sandwich, and the ultimate murder plot. Then we take a look at the bizarre disease known as visual release hallucinations. What are they? How do you get them? And did people in the past see cartoons? It works, don't worry. And then we take a look at a personal conspiracy theory of mine. Why did the government pay for us to switch to digital television? Was it really to give people a better viewing experience? Was it a way to free up the airwaves for emergency personnel? Or was it something to protect us from something dark, sinister, and headed this way? Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you're having a great day too. We're going to kind of jump into this because we got a lot to cover. I did want to say this real quick though. On a previous episode, I told people to go see Bumblebee. I think most of you guys know, as most of you guys are reaching for the skip button. Give me a second. I think most of my listeners know I'm a big Transformers fan. I did go see Bumblebee this weekend. Check it out. I enjoyed it. It was actually quite different from the other Transformers movies. If you weren't a fan of those, you know, I described it to my little brother. And I said, it felt more like an early 2000s superhero film on the level of like the original Spider-Man or the X-Men movies. The whole movie took place in one location, which you know what? And I have to say this. I did enjoy the movie, but I have a personal bone to pick with the director. The director of it, Travis Knight, is from Oregon. And the movie is set in California, but the whole movie, I thought it was set in the Pacific Northwest because it kind of looked like it. Set it in Hood River, bro. If you're going to make a movie with Bumblebee and Optimus Prime... Spoiler alert. If you're going to make a movie with Transformers walking around on Earth, set it in Hood River. Set it in a place... You grew up in the Pacific Northwest, man. Set it in... San Francisco? No. And you don't even know it's San Francisco until, like, maybe the last 10 or 15 minutes of it. They make kind of an offhand remark, and then they show the Golden Gate Bridge at the ending. Set it in Hood River! Set it at least somewhere that I can visit. That I, Dude, I would have given my left arm to simply see a film set and see the, these, the Volkswagen bug and all this stuff. I'm like, transform, transform. The director's like, these aren't real Transformers. They're just cars, dude. And I'm like, come on, you can do it, Bumblebee. Transform. But anyways, I was really, I mean, it was basically on the level of like Herbie or E.T. was more that kind of story. There weren't any of these huge... War zones that are pretty typical for the other five Transformer films, but there are some robot-on-robot fistfights, which was cool. Definitely had a different feel, but I would definitely recommend going to see Bumblebee. If you've already abandoned the franchise, but you still have a love for Transformers, I think this movie will reignite it. If you're not a fan of Transformers, but you're a fan of, like, bumbling alien on Earth stories, you may like it. Um, But I definitely liked it, but I'm a fan of the source material as well. And again, it really gave a new flavor to the story. To the whole thing. It was weird. I don't know if they... It it was kind of a reboot. Kind of a prequel. I kind of feel they did some rewrites. Because this movie was being prepped. When Transformers 5 was being released. And Transformers 5 totally bombed. Well it didn't totally bomb. But it didn't make as much money as they thought it was going to. So I'm wondering if they did some rewrites. To kind of make it more of a reboot. Because it, it kind of had a toe in each set of water. But in Transformers 5, it explained that Bumblebee actually helped fight the Nazis. And in this movie, Bumblebee leaves Cybertron for the first time. So, and, and, I did a previous episode about the theory that Optimus Prime is a murderous psychopath. And that's Michael Bay's subversive take on American politics. And this one, Optimus Prime is not as a total lunatic killing machine. So, interesting take on the source material, Travis. But I did enjoy it. So, I wanted to go ahead and talk about that, though. I do recommend it. It's a good Christmas movie, especially if you have kids as well. Or you're a kid at heart. And no, I'm not being sponsored by Mobile The Or who made it? Paramount? I'm not being sponsored by them either. I'm not being sponsored by anybody. So if you want to sponsor me, hit me up. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com. We're going to go ahead and jump into our first story, though. Our first story, this happened back in June of 2018. So very, very recent. We don't have a lot of details as far as like what's going to happen with this. But if you work in an office or you work anywhere that has a break room, we've all experienced this. Food bandits. Human raccoons is what we call them. Those of us who don't indulge in this. You bring your lunch, you bring your food to work, you put it in the fridge, and then you go later to open it up and get your ham sandwich or whatever you bring in. And there's a bite taken out of it or it's all gone. 
I actually think finding it with a bite taken out of it is more insulting. Because then someone took a bite out of your food and is so callous they could put it back in the bag. If you just go and it's missing, well, they're both idiotic. But if you go and it's missing, then you think, well, man, someone ate my sandwich. But if someone took a bite out of it and put it back, it's kind of like they're spitting in your face. I have been the victim of human raccoons maybe tw <laughs> twice in my life. It doesn't happen very often to me, but it has happened. And I know a lot of people it's happened to constantly. And the one, both times it happened to me, I was so furious, so mad. I was thinking of ways to booby trap food. I was like, oh, maybe I could like, you know, like not wash my hands. And I was like, well, Jason, you, you don't do that anyways. That's not a booby trap. That's just normally you. But you think of ways to like dirty the food and then you realize that, you could actually get in trouble for that if they get really sick and you're like, ha ha, I didn't wash my hands. And they're like, Jason, you never wash your hands. I'm like, but this day I was particularly messy. But this story doesn't involve a human raccoon. It involves something far more dangerous. So it's June, it's 2018. We are in the town, we're in Germany. So, you know, I'm going to butcher this name. We're in the town of Schloss Holt Stukenbrock. Actually, I think I got that right. Anyways, so we're in Germany. We're in this town. And this dude goes to eat his lunch, and he's like, looking around, he's like, good, no human raccoons have been here. But for whatever reason, before he eats a sandwich, he looks at it. Now, I've never done that. I've never been like, mmm, time for a good meal, time for me to turn this sandwich inside out, make sure no one's done anything to it. But for whatever reason, he gets his sandwich, and he goes, hmm. And he lifts the top piece of bread off, and he notices there's something smeared, some sort of weird powdery substance smeared on his meat. And I'm gonna... <laughs> No sex joke there. He notices there's something smeared on his meat. And he goes, this is weird. I didn't put this on. I, I, I did not add any powder to my, any, any smellless, tasteless powder to my food. What is this? So he goes to his boss and he's like, hey, man, um, there's this weird powder on my food. And I don't want to get too like crazy about it, but I didn't put this stuff on here. I don't know what it is. And the boss goes, well, you know, we have video cameras in the break room, oddly enough. And the employee's like, what? You're spying on us? And the boss is like, no, 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 no. Just forget I said that. But I will go into this room that has all these security monitors that aren't recording the break room. And I will then walk out with an answer of what happened in the break room. And as the employee stood there scratching his head, I don't know if that exchange actually happened. I would question why my boss was videotaping the break room. But they watch the video footage and they see another employee walk in pull the dude's sandwich out, and start to sprinkle a powdery substance on the sandwich. And at that point, they're like, what the hell is this? Like, what? what, what is this? Like, we should figure out what he did. I guess that there's a shorter way to say that, but... And the two guys are looking at each other, and they go, what did he do? What did he put on the sandwich? So they must have been suspicious for some point, because at that point, if I had video of someone spreading stuff on my sandwich, I would go directly talk to the person and be like, yo, bro, what'd you do? But they actually had a toxicology report run on the sandwich. And it came back, it was something called toxic acetate, acetate, toxic acetate, acetate. Anyways, the word toxic should be enough for you. It is a tasteless, smellless, highly dangerous chemical that damages your organs. Now, when I said they must have had their suspicions about this, and that's why they had it tested, there was a reason to be suspicious. At this place of business, 21 people died before they were supposed to retire. This wasn't a, they weren't police officers. This wasn't retirenee. This was people just dying in this office building, dying before they were supposed to retire. They were older, but they were dying. Two employees in a coma, one Awake, survived, but on dialysis for the rest of his life. So these people were suffering organ damage, and nobody could really figure it out. They figured, oh, maybe they're just old. And that's what happens when you get old, your organs get damaged. This guy is currently being suspected of killing 21 people, of poisoning their food. And this one dude just happened... When's the last time you've ever opened up a sandwich? To check. I don't even do that at Subway. I don't even do that when strangers make my food. I guess you get to see them make your food, but... They could always put something in the Chipotle Southwest salsa. But you know what I mean? I don't even check food that strangers give me, let alone food I prepare myself. Bizarre story. But again, this just happened in June of 2018, so he hasn't been convicted or anything like that. Hasn't even gone to trial, but we'll learn more. The next story we're going to talk about is another kind of short one. And this one is a very, very 
limited bizarre disease. It's called visual release hallucinations. It affects two types of people. It affects people who have degeneration of their eyesight. So either it's called by diabetes or old age or, I don't know, getting poked in the eye multiple times but not going blind from the first time. It's just every single day a twig hits you in the eye. The other one is very specific. It's from something called methanol poisoning, which I never heard of. And it most likely happens from drinking windshield wiper fluid. Now, I, I saw that. And I go, how many people are like, hmm, blue, <laughs> blue Gatorade, glug, glug. No, that's Windex. But apparently, that's it's not like in the top 10, but it's a more common than you would think way of killing yourself. Drinking windshield wiper fluid. That's so specific. That's not like drinking bleach or drinking ammonia or whatever. I mean, you kind of have to go out of your way to say, oh man, I just can't do it anymore. Where's the keys to the car? And they're like, no, 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 don't breathe in carbon monoxide. No, what are you talking about? I'm not going to do that. And then you're like drilling a hole. I hate to be making light of it, but that's such a specific thing. Like, why would that be your go-to thing? But it happens, surprisingly, a lot. Drinking windshield wiper fluid. I didn't even know that stuff was toxic. I want to drink it, but I didn't know it could kill you. Anyways, so if you drink too much of this windshield wiper fluid, or you just get poked in the eye multiple times, or you just have diabetes, you can develop visual release hallucinations, or it's also known as the Charles Bonnet Syndrome. And this is what you do. It's basically, it's a set of hallucinations, but they, they're they they're increasingly bizarre. The first thing is, is that... You'll be sitting there and you'll see an inanimate object. So you'll just see like a stool in the corner. And you go, that's weird. I don't own a stool. And then it's like, disappears. And you're like, Charles Bonnet. Sometimes you'll see people. And I, I'm assuming they're not inanimate. I'm sure they're like walking by and they're like, hey guys, what's up? And you will disappear. And you're like, ah, I guess I was hallucinating again. Animals. Again, you see animals. Now, what's weird is those might, you might be really seeing real people and real animals. I don't know how you would differentiate those from hallucinations unless they like evaporated or they're walking upside down or something like that but usually i guess i guess i should have read a little more of my notes because this explains why you know it's hallucination generally you'll see them and they'll be tiny tiny people so uh you know like gulliver i'm not going to talk about gulliver's travel again but like Lilliputians, like little tiny people walking around, little tiny animals. Actually, okay, so if you took a six foot person, my height, I'm a six foot five, but if you took a six foot person and you made him tiny, and now he's this tiny guy walking on your floor. If you took a cat, that's what, how tall are cats? Half a foot? And you shrunk him down, would he be the side, would the scale work? So if you saw a tiny person who used to be six feet and now he's I don't know, 10 inches, and then you took a half-foot cat, would he be also a 10-inch cat? Because it's all hallucinations. Or would he shrink down so he's the same tiny cat next to the person? If there was no person there, would you just see, like, how cats are tiny anyways? But also another weird thing is that in 1760, they were talking about this disease. They said, sometimes they were talking about the tiny people, and then they said, quote, physically impossible circumstances, unquote. Now, in modern times, what people will see with Charles Bonnet Syndrome is they will see cartoons. So, like, Mickey Mouse dancing in front of them, whistling, you know, on the steamboat, whatever. In 1760, would they have seen a cartoon? Do you have to see something for your hallucination to be based on? Would they see, like, wood carvings? Would they see, like, just a still image of a... That's kind of creepy. You're sitting in a room, and you wake up, and there's just, like, a still image of a wood carving man staring at you. But that's actually more creepy than the cartoon. But would they see... Is it possible to hallucinate something that's based on nothing that you've ever seen? Could somebody... If I was hallucinating, if I had this disease, I may see Optimus Prime and Bumblebee run by in animated form, in 1760, I'm not saying they would see Optimus Prime and Bumblebee, but would they see a cartoon run by them, even though they had no concept of what a cartoon was? How does that work? Are all of our hallucinations... I mean, I know you can hallucinate fractals and stuff like that, but that's more of like a mathematical, scientific thing. 
And you could say, well, I've never seen a fractal before, but once I started hallucinating, I started tripping out and seeing all this crazy stuff. But could you hallucinate something that you had never, ever seen before? Not like an eight-headed dragon, but I mean like the style. Could someone in 1760 hallucinate a Rob Liefeld-type drawing, even though they had no idea of the of what that would look like? They had no idea of cartoon or comic books or animation or anything like that. Could they hallucinate that? I don't know. Because if the if humans can create animation, then the animation is something... If, if, if humans can create something, then that means the human mind is capable of expressing it? Uh, I don't... I mean, like, can a, does a baby... Would a baby know what a cartoon... Could a baby hallucinate a cartoon... Without ever seeing a cartoon, because when it sees a cartoon, it understands what it is. Therefore, the brain is capable of processing it. Therefore, the brain should be able to create it itself without having ever seen it in the first place. Does that make sense? I just, I, I when I read that, I thought, that would be crazy. I mean, think about it. You already think you're going crazy. You see your uncle and your dog, they're like 10 inches tall. They're walking through the grass and you're like, oh, I must be going crazy. And then you turn around the corner and you see Donald Duck playing a xylophone. And you'd be like, I have, I have no frame of reference for that whatsoever. I've never seen 2D animation before. And here's this guy dancing around. So it's super bizarre. I, I, I don't know. But it would fit. That would be physically impossible circumstances if someone was like no there was a duck and a mouse and a dog but it didn't look like a dog it was tall but then there was an actual dog there and the guy's doctor's like dude 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 just just here i'm gonna size you for a straight jacket and just move on from here so i don't know sometimes it's just a flash of an image sometimes it lasts all day long and watching a mickey mouse cartoon for 24 hours sounds that i would just put my eyes out at that point that sounds like the worst torture possible sorry mickey you were the boringest cartoon. I'd rather watch uh, like Huckleberry Hound or something like that. And that was, ugh, that was terrible too. Okay, so our last story. Now this one I'm putting out there with a caveat. I have absolutely no proof of any of this at all. This is something that has been like a half conspiracy theory, half really cool story idea that's been cooking in my mind for a long time. I'm always a little more nervous when I put out episodes where I'm like... There's no proof of this conspiracy theory, not because I just think it's gibberish, but because I always worry that it's actually true. And the reason why there's no proof of it, because everyone who tries to talk about it ends up getting shot. But I remember when this happened, I thought, this is really bizarre that they're really concerned about this. So back in 2009, the governments of the world, the United Nations was involved in this, said, we're going to move away from analog television. And we're going to move to digital television. We're going to do everything digital. And the U.S. government had a program where they actually gave people money to buy a digital converter. I remember when it was going on and everyone was getting their vouchers and stuff like that. And I thought, why does the government care how good our broadcast signal is? Why is the government actually giving its citizens money to buy a digital converter box? Now, the reason why we switched from analog to digital, the official reason, is twofold. One, it's for better picture quality and sound. And channels could broadcast more programming on, like, a single channel. So you can have, like, channel 3 and then channel 3.1 and 3.2 and all that. And the other thing is they wanted to free up the analog airwaves for emergency personnel. And nobody questioned that. And again, this was a worldwide shift. The United Nations said, we need to have everyone over to digital by this date. And countries all over the world switched to it. Not all of them. Some of them, it was a phase in. But why did the United Nations care about the analog signal? Was the jamming up too much so a cop couldn't pick up their radio and say, I need backup, I need backup. And instead of like reruns of Welcome Back Kata are playing on it. It didn't make sense to me. It still doesn't make sense to me. But here is my conspiracy theory. Again, no proof to back this up, but it's just a hunch. It's a fanciful hunch. Whenever shows are broadcast in analog form, they leave, they're basically bounced, they're basically broadcast as like a, a circle, and they spread out. Now, low power broadcasts cannot penetrate the ionosphere of the Earth, and they just stay trapped here. But high powered broadcasts, 
can leave the ionosphere of Earth, and then they move through space at the speed of light. There's actually a really cool website I'll link in the show notes where you can see, like, on this day, what star system would be, what show this particular star system would be receiving today. And it's it's kind of guesswork. But they're saying, you know, a star 44 light years out right now would be watching, you know, something that happened 44 years ago. And they'll show you a little YouTube clip. It's just kind of a neat novelty website. Because once it leaves the atmosphere, it's moving at the speed of light. The first most powerful broadcast to leave Earth would have been, well, according to Carl Sagan, it was the Nuremberg rallies, Hitler's Nuremberg rallies. But that's actually not true. It was Hitler. It still was Hitler. But it was at the 1939 Olympic Games. I think it was 1939. It doesn't matter. It was at the Olympic Games. Do they have Olympic Games in odd years? I think they're... So, whatever. 1938. The point is, is Hitler was the first thing to be broadcast that escaped the atmosphere and went into space. But right now, let's see. If we went 50 years back, that would put us around... You're like, Jason, don't do math right now. Um, That put us somewhere around like 1968, somewhere around there. Yeah. So they'd be watching footage of America and Vietnam and stuff like that if they were 50 light years out. The question is, really they say the thing is, is like the, the way that our transmissions are based is because they're that circle, that wom, 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 and not a direct beam. Even if they do get 50 light years out and picked up by something, it'll be very diffuse. It'll be very, it'll be very hard to separate from background information. Now, we've tried to make a beam of information, the SETI, the search for extraterrestrial, whatever. They they look for aliens. They wanted to make a, like a a beam, a super powerful beam, and they shot it up out of the atmosphere. And they said, this way it won't diffuse over, you know, the light years. But if they want to watch the video footage of it, they're going to need, the aliens are going to need a array that's seven miles wide. And if they just wanted the audio, because audio tends to lose itself more, or if they want to watch the video with the audio, they would need an array that was 500 miles wide. So even with this super concise beam, it would be really hard to pick up. So our I Love Lucy episodes, really, they don't have a chance of being picked up. So the first theory that I had was that the reason why we're switching to analog and digital was basically to go black, to go dark. Cable doesn't send out the signals. Streaming doesn't send out the signals. Internet doesn't send out the signals. It's just these big, high-powerful broadcasting analog towers that would. And so if the government said, listen, we're letting everyone know where we're at. And we're just sending out wave after wave after wave of information of where we're at. And it would be the equivalent of you're, tr- you're basically hiding in a forest from a bunch of predators you're lost in a dark forest surrounded by wolves and you don't know where the wolves are and they don't know where you are and then you break out your boom box and start playing steve winwood top volume and now they know where you're at and you still don't know where they are until they're it's too late they're too close so the first idea was the, that that we're going to go dark and then you you would have to roll into that that all of this SETI building the beam and stuff like that, that that's all fake that they didn't really do that. The reason why the theory didn't necessarily wash with me is because we have I mean assuming that NASA is not totally lying to us and all that stuff. We've sent out satellites, we've sent out Voyager, SETI's doing their thing and stuff like that. But what if the reason why we switched to digital television is to not hide ourselves from some other race out there, but to hide them from us. Because it would work both ways. If a broadcast signal was headed towards Earth, the analog stations could pick it up now. And I did earlier say you would need a concentrated beam and a receiving array that, you know, five to 500 miles long, or seven to 500 miles long, whatever it was. But And that's based on our technology. But what if their technology that's broadcasting is far more powerful and it could be picked up by your local neighborhood antenna? They're broadcasting an analog signal. They haven't moved to digital. And we've detected it coming towards this planet. And the step was was the United Nations saying, listen, there's one of two things that are going to happen. One day, people around the world are going to turn on their televisions and they're going to begin receiving these transmissions from an alien race, or we just 
take all of our analog towers offline and everyone has to do digital. So those waves just pass right through the planet and we never know that they came. Now, there are still low power analog antennas in some countries. There are still things like ham radio operators, CB radios and things like that. But there's a big difference between having, say, 5 billion people watching a signal and 1% of them actually getting enough clarity of what the image looks like to be able to make a determination like something's really wrong here versus 500 million people on their ham radios, low-power antennas, CB radios, what have you, and 1% of them picking up that signal. It's a lot easier to hide if you just say, oh, no, 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 that was just some glitch. But if some guy's just working on his ham radio and one day he picks up... He may log into something weird. He may record it, but that's a lot easier to dispute than the population of the world picking that up. Because here's the thing. When we talk about aliens, we imagine them to be... You know, you have the fictional aliens where they have their ships, they fly around, they blow stuff up. And then you have the aliens that people say exist, like gray aliens or reptilians or the blonde white people, what are they called? The Luminarians or something. The Pleiadians. And they seem to be, they like the reptilians are supposedly evil, but it's a very like antiseptic evil. It's a very like human evil. But imagine getting a broadcast from an alien planet. We think, imagine if an alien planet saw the Nuremberg rallies, or an alien planet saw news footage of the Vietnam War. Could you even imagine the horrors that could come from an alien planet of their broadcasts? We always see the greys as kind of like just walking around their ship, kind of tooling around with instruments, or the reptilians, kind of like V, where they're kind of like this regal enemy. That eat people, but then they also like walk on two legs and stuff like that, and they shape shift and all that type of stuff. But what if we saw a television broadcast, a true television broadcast from an alien planet? What type of evil and filth and truly like it's it's alien. Our brains, even a reptilian, is familiar to us. But something from another planet that is evolved along a completely different path that shares none of our DNA. Just like I was talking about on the previous segment, can you imagine something that you can't imagine, that you have no concept for? That's what it would be like to see an alien broadcast. Would we even be able to recognize things like individuals in a crowd, a some sort of narrative, some sort of character. We wouldn't. You would see an alien broadcast and it would just fill you with revulsion because it is something that is so unnatural for a human to see. You can show me a video of greys dissecting a human being. You can show me a video of a reptilian eating some somebody. Those are still familiar things because I've seen things be devoured and I've seen dissections in science class. But imagine seeing something alien doing something alien to another alien thing. It would be the definition of H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu-level horror. Even if on their planet it was something completely mundane, to us it would be so disturbing. On their planet it could be the equivalent of a sitcom, but to us we would see nothing but pure horror in it because what we're experiencing what we're seeing and hearing is truly incomprehensible to us it is on another planet with another life form another culture another language another i mean you you could go there's you you couldn't even you could you even see that they were talking to each other or would it just be horror upon horror upon horror imagery and sound that was coming from this alien planet whether or not they would ever reach us wouldn't matter but if we got this alien broadcast and we saw these incomprehensible inhuman things it would fill us with such dread we would never want to go out we would never want to see what's out there because we would know that the universe isn't full of life like us with two arms and two legs and brains and eyes and they have power struggles and they're fighting for control of Earth and the reptilians are over here 
and the Greys are here, and the Conformers are here, and the Pleiadians are here, and they have these structures. You have the Starship Athena, you have all this stuff. 2012, Antarctica ice bases. All these things are human concepts. We see the universe in a very Star Trek, Star Wars type of way, where you could go to a bar and sit next to an alien and not throw up because he's so gross and the smell of him is so toxic because he has a different evolutionary path on a different planet that you've never been to. We see it, it'll be like, hey Spock, Spock would stink like a mofo. Spock would be the most disgusting person you could, well maybe not Spock because he's half human, but you know what I mean? Like you would have these, well you wouldn't be able to bang another alien, but you would have these huge differences. It's just like, we we do it here. When we build a robot that looks too human, or we make CGI that looks too human, it's called the Uncanny Valley. It makes us sick. Times that by a thousand, and you have what it would be like to look at an alien broadcast. So is that why we went dark? Not to hide us from them, but to hide them from us. Because if we knew what was truly out there in the darkness of space, forget the probes. Forget SETI. Forget sending these messages of recordings of Beethoven and pictures of a man and a woman. That would all be done in an instant. And humanity would be that kid in a forest, surrounded by wolves, and just trying to close their eyes and hope that they are never found. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be your email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at Jason O. Carpenter. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. <laughs>